Welcome to the New Chemist podcast. We're glad you're listening. Feel free to download this podcast on Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. Here on the New Chemist, we discuss chemistry, which simply put is the science of change, as well as the other sciences, careers, community research, and COVID-19. My guest today is Dr. Sarah Scrabalak the Graduate Program Director in the Department of Chemistry at Indiana University of Bloomington, which is where I study. Thanks for joining me today. It is so good to hear from you. Just briefly, I'll inform my audience about you. Sarah Scrabalak received her BA in Chemistry from Washington University in St. Louis in 2002, where she conducted research with Professor William E. Bruhur. She then moved to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where she completed her PhD in chemistry in fall of 2006. Under the tutelage of Professor Kenneth S. Susser, after conducting postdoctoral research at the University of Washington, Seattle, with Professors Yunnan Jia and Jingli Li, she began on the faculty at Indiana University Bloomington in 2008. She is currently a James H. Rudy Professor at Indiana University. She was also appointed Editor-in-Chief for the ACS Journal's Chemistry of Materials and ACS Materials Letters in 2020. She is a recipient of both NSF Career and Department of Energy Early Career Awards. She is a 2012 Research Corporation Cottrell Scholar, a 2013 Sloan Research Fellow, a 2014 Camille Dreyfus Teacher Scholar, and a 2017 Guggenheim and Fulbright Fellow. In 2014, she received the ACS Award in Pure Chemistry, and in 2017 was a recipient of the Frontiers in Research Excellence and Discovery Award from Research Corporation. She served as an associate editor for the Royal Society of Chemistry's journal Nanoscale from 2017 to 2020, Nanoscale Horizons from 2018 to 2020. Her group is developing new synthetic methods to solid materials with defined shapes and architecture, then studying the properties of the materials as they are applied to applications in energy science, chemical sensing, and secured electronics. Please welcome Dr. Sarah Strong. Hi, Dr. Scrabalak, Sarah, thanks for joining me today. It is good to uh, have you here. Oh, I'm super excited to be a part of your podcast. Yeah, thank you. So I, I would say by any stretch of any scientific measurement, you have been successful as a professor. So what have been your longstanding interests in the field of science? Well, if we were to go back to when I was a high school student, so starting really early on, I always liked science, but chemistry was the class that got me uh, very interested uh, in pursuing uh, science as a career. I had a really awesome teacher, Anne Perot. Uh, she liked to set a lot of things on fire and was very entertaining in the classroom. Uh, and that kept me interested to actually learn um, a bit about molecules and their reactivity, um, even at that early age. And then uh, really getting into research as an undergraduate um, shaped what I have been doing for my entire independent career, because it was there that I was introduced to materials chemistry and nanoscience, okay. um, which are the, the primary areas that I'm really interested in. Okay, wow. So you got exposure to that in your undergraduate years? Yeah, I started doing... Um, well, I first started doing research in a biophysical lab for about a year um, in, uh, when I was a sophomore in college. Uh, that research was fine, but I wasn't um, as excited by the day-to-day -day act um, lab work that I was doing. Mm -hmm. So then I switched my junior year into a materials chemistry lab and started on uh, synthesis, a synthesis project and I just immediately fell in love with the idea of making new materials and using microscopes to characterize them and that's something that I've continued to do uh, well my students now do but uh, I definitely uh, continue to do all that through um, 
my PhD and postdoc as well. Wow, that's good. So given um, the challenges that a lot of people are facing, how do you maintain view of the bigger picture in your career and in your life in general? How do you see the forest for the trees? How do you keep big ideas in mind? Um, you could take this from an academic standpoint or from a general standpoint. Yeah, well, I I do, I am pretty good at sort of separating my professional career and my personal life. So I, I, I kind of see them as slightly, slightly different in terms of big picture. Um, in terms of, you know, big picture and research and in my career, I think a lot of that comes from talking with other scientists and reading the literature to some extent, but it really is my interactions with other um, faculty and students, talking to them about their work, learning about their work and what excites them. And then when they listen to a presentation that I give, for example, and ask questions, the questions that they sometimes ask are just so incredible. And it makes me take a step back and start to think a bit differently about the work that my group is doing and helps me to see that big picture and pursue new directions. I think in life, um, I maintain a view of the bigger picture. Uh, but prior to COVID, it really came from traveling a lot. Okay. I love traveling. I've been all over the world. And every time I travel and interact with people, I, I get a better understanding of myself, but also of all the things that are, that really unite us and common themes and also different perspectives on how one can live life and be happy and um, it's not always about the pursuit of um, big career goals that provide satisfaction and sometimes those that traveling really puts a lot of um, a lot of things in perspective yeah so. that's true you know for me and this may sound a little trivial but for me it's having some good Bahamian food <laughs> <laughs> It's good. It's a reminder. It brings me home. It helps to center me, helps me to reflect. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because it's it's about it's those are small things, but they do matter a lot. I just really like to interact with people who are, are very different from me mm -hmm. um, and see what makes them excited about life um, and what what motivates them. And it helps me stay grounded and not while I'm very focused on my career, it also helps me re remember that that's not everything in my life. Um, I have, you know, um, family and friends that are so important. And um, it's really those interactions that, that bring lots of satisfaction. Um, and you get reconnected with that uh, when traveling and talking to different people and things like that. Yeah, that's true. So um, along the same lines uh, of your research and all the things you've done in science, how have you been adaptive and creative in the field of science? What would you say has been your niche that you are really scoping and helping to blaze a trail for? Yeah, so I, my, I really like to make materials. Okay. And I like to come up with how to make new materials that have never been made before. But I think a, a, a unique feature of my group's research is we like to try to make very complex materials, mm -hmm. either compositionally or structurally, but do it with a high level of precision where we could place every atom exactly where we would like them to be wow. uh, in three-dimensional space so that we could have some properties that emerge that would otherwise not not exist or not be as beneficial uh, if you didn't achieve that level of complexity and precision. Wow. So I have a question in relation to that. Um, 
you made the statement you want to make materials that are either compositionally or structurally complex. Mm-hmm. So are they exclusively are they mutually exclusive or are they dependent something being compositionally complex or structurally complex it's often combined okay. we're, often, we're often looking for things that are combining both of these points so for example there about 20 years ago mm-hmm. um, the in the field of nanoscience people were very excited because you could start to make nanoparticles where of simple compositions such as just silver or just gold and you could control the shape of those nanoparticles so rather than just being spherical they could be cubic or rod like okay. now my group likes to maintain achieve those kind of shapes but for something where maybe it consists of two or three metals rather than just one So we're building in compositional complexity into those very nicely defined shapes. At the same time, we also have been providing new synthetic methods that allow us to get even more complex shapes than just a cube or a rod. For example, we recently published a paper where we made gold palladium nanoparticles that have the high symmetry and um, hierarchy of snowflakes. Are you serious? Yeah. Wow. They're so beautiful. Just like snowflakes, they're so beautiful. And um, that kind of coupling of complex composition, complex shapes, just really wasn't possible even five years ago, let alone 20 years ago. Wow. Yeah, that's cool stuff. So in terms of the environment, because I would say you are thriving scientifically and intellectually, how did you seek or find the right environment? What what were the parameters or the, the litany of facts that you went through to determine which environment would be best in terms of Indiana University or your undergraduate and graduate institutions? What helped you determine which school was right for you? Yeah. Which place was right for you? Well, both as a... Uh, both as an undergrad and as a grad student, I think the the guiding principle was finding a place where I felt comfortable, where I could be myself, mm-hmm. um, where I felt like people were not going to um, judge me on things that were uh, superficial, but rather in terms of well, not necessarily judging, but supporting me based off of um, the contributions that I could bring scientifically and also in terms of broader, um, uh, just broader experience. Mm -hmm. So I was really grateful both as an undergrad and as a grad student to pick the right school for me where I felt like the environment was very supportive and allowed me to be my myself but I also had great advisors who um, also were very comfortable with who they were mm-hmm. would share who they were and I think that the fact that they were so open about who they were and what their interests were outside of the lab um, made me feel very comfortable and also supportive to let to to um, pursue uh, my interests both scientifically but also outside of the lab. Um, coming to IU, honestly, IU was the place that made me the best offer when I had a job when I was interviewing for jobs. Okay. And so I went to the place that provided me with the best offer. Okay. Uh, but I also was really happy to um, return to the Midwest. I had done most of my schooling in the Midwest, but had postdoced out in Seattle. And both my husband and I were looking to come back to the Midwest. So um, besides having the best offer, uh, IU was in a location that we knew we both would really like. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you you don't necessarily get to have a lot of choice at that stage but luckily um, IU has been a very supportive environment Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I feel like I have been able to pursue all of my interests Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and they have provided me with generous resources to support my group and um and research is at large so um it's turned out to be very very good <laughs> yeah yeah and i like it there i do like it there as a graduate student in the program i like it there i think it's just important for you to stay focused and get what you need to get done so you mentioned the thing the theme of you know people were okay with themselves like authentic self so would you say um a culture of authenticity is worth complimenting to you being able to progress and um achieve what you achieve um at those institutions yeah I, yeah i think so for example my phd advisor he had um he had a um young son at the time and um was doing a lot of the child care caring so he would talk a lot about being a father and the things he was doing with his son at the same time he also really loved to travel and collect masks from different regions of the world okay. and had this huge interest in um and folk music and folk traditions and also doing metal work. Mm -hmm. And so he would share all of these interests and hobbies with us and that made me feel very comfortable to, you know, share some of my interests. Okay. Uh and also it gave me a feeling that, you know, I didn't have to well I had to work hard and I had to bring forward results and show growth as a scientist and um and develop an independent research mind at the mm -hmm. same time it was okay for me to um spend my weekends uh doing the things that i like to do um okay. that aren't science related and oh, yeah. um and so that made me feel very comfortable and supported overall okay oh, yeah. it's good So yeah, this is this is a, this is really making some really good points. So you made the point of developing an independent research mind. So how did you how did you go about doing that? Because you know many times people springboard off of what the PI is doing and transition and try to make a niche from that. How did you um, develop an independent research mind? Well, it's not so fully independent in the sense that. you know all all almost all current ideas are coming from prior knowledge okay that's true and it's a, and it's a matter of how you're putting that knowledge together in creative ways and i think some of the the best ways of developing that is to continually read okay. the scientific literature okay. to go to seminars to talk mm -hmm. with people mm -hmm. um to not be afraid of asking questions when you don't know something mm -hmm. that's something that's honestly incredibly difficult for me to this day i don't like to ask questions in seminar uh but i try very hard to uh and if i feel uncomfortable even to this day i will um i will uh talk to people you know after the seminar or something but making sure that i ask questions um and sometimes go to go to seminars that are a little bit out of my area of expertise. Okay. Uh that's great. Actually in my research group right now we started something new for our literature pre presentations where um we're not allowed nobody's allowed to present on a paper that is related to materials chemistry. Oh wow. Uh you have to present a top paper from some other area of chemistry. and so far the discussions have been incredibly insightful mm -hmm. they've been challenging us and we've been brainstorming new ideas oh, wow. um we haven't started any new projects from them yet but i i'm cautiously optimistic that if we continue this uh we might end up with some new ideas so yeah that's good that's very good so um what would you say is helping you to maintain or trying to maintain uh, what helps you to maintain a balanced life given all your responsibilities and accomplishments oh so i totally you... i totally don't have a balanced life there... okay okay that's cool that's cool <laughs> I'll, I'll, be, <laughs> i'll be completely honest i work too much um okay. but i i really love my work mm -hmm. um and i'm really motivated by the 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 dedication 
and time that my graduate students and undergraduates put into their research. Mm -hmm. And so I want to give that back to them. Mm -hmm. uh, if they are willing to put in the time for, for the research, I want to put the time in for them. And that, given all the responsibilities I have, it doesn't um, give a lot more time for um, other things. But I still have my hobbies. I still uh, interact and, and um, do fun things with family and friends. Mm -hmm. um, probably not as much as I would like. That's why I'm saying it's not balanced. Mm -hmm. But I'm still overall very happy. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah. I think that's probably the most important thing. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's good. You know, I, I think it's interesting you said, you know, your students put in a lot of work to you and make sure you give it back to them. So you're being, you're so you are reciprocating. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's good. Um, so um, I, hope I, I hope that I am, you know, my students might have their own interpretation of things, but, um, you know, that that's how I tend to try to view things. Um, hopefully it comes across to them. Okay. Yeah, I hear you. So um, from your bio, it, you, I, I'd say you have been very accomplished. You are a Sloan Research Fellow, a Camille Draper Teacher Scholar, a Guggenheim Fellow, a Fulbright Fellow. And I would say you have been a fellow in many other gods. <laughs> so so um, how have you been able to be so successful, Sarah? Uh, what, what is complimenting your success? What is it the people that you're around? Is it your approach to learning content? Is it the time that you put in? Um, what are the parameters that have complemented the most your I think, success thus far? You know, I think hard work um, and time is a big part of it. Okay. But I also have students who, you know, they push me. They okay. are, you know, they are excited. They work hard. And so, as I said, I want to work hard for them. And that means providing opportunities and so a lot of these awards um some of them are ones where you they provide an opportunity for me to learn something new mm -hmm. or start a collaboration and that helps us move our research forward um, at the same time you know all of those awards are recognition of the creativity that my students have shown and wow. So I, you know, I think it's the, the relationship that I have with them where, um, you know, we're working mutually towards advancing their interests and their goals. Um, and at the same time, it ends up allowing for these different types of recognitions to come forward. Um, but I, I, I think some of it is just foster, trying to foster a supportive environment where okay. students will collaborate and troubleshoot together mm -hmm. to move their projects forward um i'm i'm just always amazed by um how well they work together oh, yeah. and you know so i i i really have to attribute a lot of the success to them okay that's good that's good so how do you maintain you you have achieved a, lot, a number of things so how do you maintain vision and teamwork in your environment in your lab in your work environment how are you maintaining that yeah sometimes the vision ends up getting spread out a whole lot because we have a lot of different projects and um it can make it difficult because the the vision just gets diffuse but i always try to come back to this idea of increasing complexity with precision to bring new function and if a project doesn't fit within that theme then it's probably not something that we're going to make a large contribution to um, or if we are going to ultimately make a large contribution to it's it would take um, a lot of effort to move us in that direction mm -hmm. and that's where I have to make a conscious decision. Is it worth, is the idea big enough and the potential impact big enough hmm. that it's worth shifting from that, that theme? Um, so wow. every so often I, I will come back and think about, well, if the group is focused on this big theme, do the projects fit within that big theme? If they don't, then 
it's probably something we want to cut from our research portfolio. Wow. But you still want to sort of play in that in these areas that don't fit perfectly for a while to see what develops. Okay. So because they could really spawn something new and exciting, mm -hmm. but you have to you have to pick and choose because you only have so much time and mm -hmm. only so much so much money to support research. So that's true. That's true. Um, so it, it it takes a little bit of remembering what what your core strengths are and oh. reevaluating. The teamwork, you know, I just I just like to celebrate everything. Yeah. Um, you know, we I and I think that the idea that we celebrate everybody's contributions mm -hmm. uh, to our research, making sure that small contributions get acknowledged yeah. because that um, they make the bigger thing, mm -hmm. the bigger goals be met. Um, I, I think that, that all of that is really important to having a good environment to work in. Okay. Okay. So um, I feel like I should, I, I, I'm taking notes because some of these things are really good themes. So you said increasing complexity with, with precision to what? Oh, to bring new function or properties. To bring new function. Wow. That sounds like that, that has some philosophical implications, but I, I'll restrain myself. <laughs> I'll restrain myself. So yeah, that's, that's a good one. So, um, and you also mentioned how you, you said, if I, I, what I took away from that is you said the idea doesn't have the capacity to maintain the overarching themes or the vision of the lab. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. So um, just as we conclude, um, do you have any advice to those wanting to pursue the field you are currently working in? Um. Well, I think one thing that I often encounter is that if you're an undergraduate, uh, oftentimes materials chemistry and nanoscience isn't taught in classes. Okay. Um, or maybe it's a small unit within one course that you've taken. And I think that that can make people a little bit scared to try the, the, this type of research. And I think that one of the, the, the best things that, um, the best pieces of advice that I could possibly give is simply think about what kinds of questions make you very excited. Mm -hmm. And also, how do you like to spend your day to day? Um, you know, what, what are your day to day activities? Mm -hmm. So I like to think about how you make things and how do you place atoms exactly where you want to do them. Mm -hmm. So that makes uh, makes synthesis and nanoscience a really you know really good uh, fit for me. At the same time, I also really liked uh, working out of hood, uh, making solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, doing microscopy to characterize materials, which made it, it made uh, material synthesis in particular a good fit. Okay. Uh, whereas in contrast, I remember shadowing my first year as a graduate student. I remember shadowing um, a graduate student in a, a, a lab different from the one that I ended up joining. And while the research questions were awesome and I was really excited by them, a lot of their day-to-day -day, um, responsibilities involve um, having to fix and calibrate instrumentation. And I just really didn't like that. The, the student who was working on that project really liked that, that part. And the thought of, the thought of making a material, uh, you know, they were uninterested in at all. Mm -hmm. But um, so I think, you know, really think about how you want to spend your days okay. think about what kind of questions you want to try to answer mm -hmm. and that's how you know you get into a particular area um and that'll help keep you motivated as well yeah yeah, yeah. that's true that's very true motivation because motivation helps to prevent burnout yeah. yeah yeah that's true so um yeah you mentioned that 
I, what I took away from what you said is that you know you have to find excitement in the ordinary routines that you go through in the day to day, whether it's working in the lab or working at some job. So, in terms of advice that you have received, what has been some of the most beneficial advice you have received? I have received contradictory advice from different people that I think um, is important. Uh, at one point in my career, I had a um, person who I looked up to and had, you know, the the career that I would like to have. Mm. And I asked her, you know, how did how did you get to this stage? And, and everything. She's like, well, I didn't say. She's like, I said yes to everything, or I didn't say no. And, um, and so I think that that was really incredible advice because it it made me um, it provide it by saying yes to a lot of things, especially early in my career. Mm. It provided me with a lot of different types of experiences okay. that I've been able to put together in interesting ways mm. to achieve a whole range of different career goals. Okay. At the same time, I've heard from many, many people that you need to say no more. Okay. Uh, you say yes too, too much. Okay. And I think that they're probably correct as well because um, there's only so many hours in the day mm -hmm. and um, you can burn yourself out by saying yes to too many things mm -hmm. um, and everything. So so I think the fact that I have gotten both of the both of those um, pieces of advice pieces of advice that are in complete contradiction to one another mm -hmm. um, provides actually the most beneficial advice, which is that be selective, but say yes to things that excite you and say no to things that don't open new new doors. Okay, yeah, that's good. So um, yeah, I think it's just a matter of balance. I think it's a matter of balance because I, my stage in my career, which is very, 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 very early, um, I have to. Be, I can't be saying no to everything, and I can't be saying yes to everything. So yeah. I think I think it's a balance. So yeah. So um, I think this is very these, what you're saying is very timely. So it make it a little bit more practical. Um, how have you been? So I'm sure you read a lot, read a lot of papers and stuff like that. So how have you been able to be efficient in your scientific reading of literature? whether it be journals or textbooks. This is like a tip for undergrads or graduate students. How have you been efficient in that practical aspect? Yeah, well, I definitely will say that as a graduate student, I, I was not efficient at okay. reading papers okay. at all. Okay. The efficiency came when I started as an associate editor for Nanoscale and now I'm editor-in-chief for Chemistry of Materials and ACS Materials Letters. And in both of those positions, you often have to evaluate um, 10 to 20 papers in a short period of time, uh, you know, a matter of a, 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 a few days. And you obviously can't um, read them uh, to the point where you are um, you know, that that you know you can't spend hours on each paper, mm -hmm. um, and so I've really broken it down to looking at the abstract and reading the abstract to pull out the you know the key ideas, looking at the introduction and especially the end of the introduction, mm -hmm. what the new the big conclusions are that they're mm -hmm. that they're setting up or what their experimental design is and then um looking at figures very closely because okay. the figures have the data uh and as you get more and more experience uh you get used to looking at a lot of the same 
you you get very comfortable looking at particular types of data. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can often look at the data and with the insight from the um, intro and the conclusions, um, oftentimes you can see how that data fits into the narrative that they're that they're talking about. Uh, you know, does it support or not? And then you can, you know, as needed, dig into the deep, deeper discussion. Mm -hmm. um, but oftentimes, you know, you're looking for big themes rather than fine details. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's something where, um, you know, by looking at the figures, looking at the abstract, uh, you can really sort of pull out the big themes and then um, decide, is this, you know, you can keep that big theme, which is important in your brain, um, but then you can decide, do I, do I need to read this paper in greater detail or not? Right. Um, and so that's how I've been approaching uh, my own, you know, that's how I approached looking at a lot of papers, um, but also that's how I now read a lot of papers too, right. where you're not, I'm not digging into the finer details. I'm often trying to get the big ideas and big themes, mm -hmm. and then I'll come back for the finer details when I really need them. That's true. Yeah, I get what you're saying. And you know, that brings me, you know, that reminds me of an analogy. Like in the lab, we do a lot of extractions with separatory funnels. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to draw an analogy. So. Um, if you know what you're looking for, you know which layer to extract. And then as time progresses, you get the fine details or the concentrate, and then you purify that some more. So yeah. for example, I think that, that makes a lot of sense. You, you can you can look for the fine details all the time and spend hours and hours and hours on one particular paper, because then you won't get the things you need to get done. So yeah. You've yeah. got to pick and choose. Yeah. Uh, you know, choose which fraction you're going to read uh, or go and analyze by NMR and mass spec. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That is very true. <laughs> yep. That's practical. Very practical. So thanks again, Sarah, for joining me. It is good to have you on. It's a pleasure. Thanks for listening. We're glad you were able to tune into this podcast. Once again, this is The New Chemist, where we discuss chemistry, which simply put is the science of change, as well as the other sciences, careers, community, research, and COVID-19. Thanks again for listening. Note, the views on this podcast represent those of my guests and I.